Dr. Turner, good to see you again. We're talking today about clearing up the confusion that seems to have erupted over the PAP test. And so let's just get right into it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because I wanna make sure I ask this correctly, I'm gonna read here from my notes. It says the American Cancer Society and other medical groups came out with new guidelines for cervical cancer testing using the PAP test, but that the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists did not concur with these new recommendations until just this past October. Why the delay? Part of the delay was the mechanism by which gynecologists checked on the health of their patients and used the annual pap smear as the mechanism of getting patients into the office. The pap smear came out in the 40s and was, began to be widely adapted in the 50s and 60s and was very successful in reducing death rates for cervical cancer. Get the pap smear, come in, the physician would do everything else that's associated with an annual exam and with ongoing relationship with the patient about what's happening with her as her life changes 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and developed a longitudinal relationship with the patient so the patient's gynecologist knew what had happened for her in many cases better than any other physician and the pap smear was the thing that brought her back in. The other medical groups did not have that as a clinical context for the patient relationship. The woman would come in in the 30s, in the 40s for an annual pap smear and very uncommonly she would come up with abnormal changes. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, the gynecologist was also checking on weight, height, blood pressure, sugar, changes uh, for diabetes. Um, thyroid abnormalities, uh, instructing the patient in breast exams, initiating mammograms um, in, the, in the 40s. And all this occurred during the annual pap smear and the annual exam. So the annual test then occasioned other exactly. useful uh, interface with the physician on a, on a regular basis. On a regular basis, yes. Okay. That makes sense. Under the new guidelines, who should get a pap test and how often should she get it? I'm going to direct this question according to the guidelines off my piece of paper here Okay. and it's age group related. Under 21 you don't need a Papa Nicolau smear. You don't need a pap smear. Okay. Between 20 and 29 years of age every three, every three years but you don't need the HPV testing in that time period. This is just looking for abnormal cells on the pap smear. Okay. Since almost every cervical cancer is caused by the human papillomavirus, almost right. every squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix is caused by the HPV virus, then in the ages 30 to 65, the HPV screening will tell us whether or not you've got the high risk HPV strain that can potentially cause okay. cervical cancer. But I like to use the diagram, this is normal and this is invasive cancer. Well, you've got a lot of women out there who have been exposed to the HPV, HPV virus, but they never make the progress through mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia, severe dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, invasive cancer. Mm -hmm. They just have the HPV virus that's there. Now, the terminology over the decades has changed. Now, if you had mild or moderate severe dysplasia on your pap smear back in the um, 60s and 70s and early 80s, but especially moderate and severe dysplasia, remember that about lifetime testing. Right. If you had a cone biopsy, if you had a LEAP procedure, uh, and for some women who may have had their cervix frozen, if it was for moderate or severe dysplasia, mm -hmm. that's probably due to the human papillomavirus, and they're the ones that we're gonna follow the rest of your life. Okay, if you haven't had those, if you've never had an abnormal pap smear, then we get to this situation where women between 30 and 65 can get by with a pap smear and an HPV test every five years, or just the pap smear alone every three years. Okay. Let's get a little quick uh, definition, you, a term you've used, dysplasia. Dysplasia is the situation where you have cells that are not normal, 
they're turning into cells that can potentially end up as cancer cells. Okay. So you would, in lay terms, precancerous or potentially precancerous. Potentially cells. precancerous. And remember, not every precancerous lesion turns into cancer. Right. Now, that's where we get into the abnormalities in the young girls under 21. They get exposed to the HPV virus, yes. Sexual promiscuity relative to our generations, yes, it's out there. Right. But they see the virus, they handle the virus, they get rid of the virus on their own. Okay. And so, while, while we're not screening in them, is we didn't want bad things to happen from intervening too aggressively on women who weren't going to end up with cervical cancer. Okay. You, we've talked about this. Let's just segue into it. The human papillomavirus, the HPV test. It's recommended that that test uh, occur concurrently with the pap test. Why is HPV screening important? That's going to tell us who the patient is that's at risk for becoming, uh, bec from, from developing cervical cancer. Okay. Okay. If I can throw in one aside here, if you're a cigarette smoker, stop. Mm -hmm. That is the one thing that you can change right now that's going to change your risk at developing cervical cancer right alone. You know, you picked up an abnormal pap smear and HPV, old X, you know, mm -hmm. all that garbage. Nevertheless, if you're a cigarette smoker, stop. That's the biggest thing I can tell you to do right now. All right. All these changes in terms of the, the, uh, the protocols for the tests, what led to these changes and why were they necessary? When we looked at HPV screening around the world, and the benefit that we have here is that we looked at screening populations all around the world, Europe, South America, Asia, Britain, India, and we kind of understood what you were doing when you screened hundreds of thousands and millions of patients. And that's when we could figure out exactly what the real risk was of something actually ending up as a cancer. And we're just trying to prevent cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, cervical cancer is basically preventable. Almost every case of cervical cancer that I've had in my 30 odd years as a gynecologist has been because somebody just didn't get treated, didn't get follow up. Very rarely is it something that's just a really bad woman eating cancer and there wasn't anything to do that our best efforts could stop. They went without years without a pap smear, did not see their physician, did not follow up. Right. So what we realized is that it doesn't usually end up that way. We didn't want to be treating with unnecessary surgical procedures and diagnostic tests that might cause things like incompetent cervix, which might end up with preterm labor, mm -hmm. which might end up with a premature delivery. Mm -hmm. things like that. And we didn't want all the surgical procedures being done unnecessarily on a 19-year-old girl who's not going to develop cervical cancer. Right. Leave it on, watch it, she can handle it, it'll go away. Okay. One, recommend, one recommendation that did not change is related to young women under the age of 21. You talked about this a moment ago, but let's give it its own little place here. The guideline is that these women should not be screened for cervical cancer or HPV, and given the fact that you know sexual activity among young women is much higher than it was a generation ago, why is it not important that they be screened? Screening for cervical cancer. That doesn't mean that's not screening for gonorrhea, chlamydia. Right. Advising patients the risk of sexually transmitted viruses like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. Right. In rare cases, syphilis. Don't see syphilis on, you know, too commonly. But really, chlamydia and gonorrhea testing, mm -hmm. those things can cause infertility. And she may not be thinking infertility at age 16 through 19, but she's definitely wondering what she had done when she's 30 and 32 mm -hmm. at that age, wondering what about this damage that I had from a, uh, a neglected or untreated or um, sexually transmitted disease. So yes, screening is important in these younger women it's just not screening for the human papillomavirus for cervical cancer. Okay. Sixty percent of all women in the U.S. that have had a total hysterectomy and who no longer have a cervix are nonetheless being given a pap test which screens for cervical cancer. Why? That was what the gynecologists were using as the thing to get the woman back in. And the comfort. Some women just wanted to be sure. 
They just, they just felt comfortable having a Papanicolaou smear. It's like having a negative mammogram. It's like having a negative colonoscopy, having a negative passer. No cancer there. Um, going forward, the critical thing for my patients is going to be, did you have moderate or severe dysplasia? Or in the nomenclature in the 80s and 90s, did you have CIM2 and 3? Capital C, capital I, capital N, 2, 3. Did you have carcinoma in situ? Now, those women who had that diagnosis on a pap smear before their hysterectomy or even treated are the ones that will follow on farther out. Uncommonly, you can get cancer of the vagina. You can get cancer of the vulva, and those can be HPV related. Okay. And that's why we'll do the screening at that point. But usually, patients are immunocompetent. They handle these virus, viruses very well. Now, now, if you got HIV, yes, we do have to follow you for that. Right. I'll continue doing a pap smear on that. If you're immunocompromised for some other reason, um, uh, chemotherapy for another condition or, mm -hmm. or uh, a transplant patient, something like that, yes, those are special situations. All right. Given that it's no longer recommended that a woman get an annual pap test, does this mean you don't need to see the doctor once a year? I'm a gynecologist, and I feel like... Um, I try to treat my patients that I'm the doctor who's really going to relate to you long term. Right. I have a special interest in you, you as a woman, you as a person. I'm interested in what's happening in your life. Um, I believe that that's the interaction of the person who's going to follow you. Women healthcare professionals, there's some good general practice physicians, internists, family practice doctors who thoroughly enjoy women's health care. Right. And that person is going to be the person whom we're most comfortable answering your health health questions. I don't mind that. I don't mind my patients looking to me as a gynecologist for that reason. Mm -hmm. But on a once year basis, let's cover the things that are happening in your life. Diabetes, cholesterol, exercise, uh, smoking, drinking, drug use, what about those things? What other lifestyles do we need to address in you? And as a gynecologist, I'm glad to provide that service to my patient. So it's hard for me to say, don't come in for an annual exam because I'm scared of what's going to happen if I don't have that prompt to bring people interfacing with the healthcare community on a frequent basis. Makes sense. Doctor, as always, thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it.